All right, guys, let's get started. So welcome back from spring break. I guess we have a smaller group of people, monotonically shrinking. Um, all right, so uh, today we're going to talk about a new topic of web security. Uh, it's a sort of an interesting uh, topic to discuss. Um, as you've probably seen from the readings, it's a kind of a messy situation, what's going on with web security. Uh, and you can sort of think of web security as the thing that happened between desktop operating systems and mobile devices. So desktop operating systems don't really have much of a security plan uh, for uh, things running for one user. Mobile uh, devices like Android, iOS phones, they have a pretty sophisticated plan like we talked about. And uh, web security sort of happened a decade or two before mobile devices, and as a result, people didn't figure out yet quite how to do it right, and uh, you sort of see the result in uh, what you read for today's lecture. Kind of a messy situation, but uh, sort of, for better or worse, important nonetheless. Uh, so we'll try to make sense of it and try to figure out what principles are there uh, underlying this whole plan. But ask questions. It's a sort of even more messy than usual topic, if you will, and uh, we can discuss. All right, so, so what, what is web security for us? So um, what's going on in a web browser that uh, makes this uh, an interesting security problem? Well, the thing that's going on in a web browser is that you're probably browsing lots of different sites. So if you have a web browser on your machine, uh, you might actually be connecting to many different websites out there. So it might be that there's you know, a gmail.com server out there, and you want to visit that website. Well, you're going to open a tab that's going to run Gmail. And by run, I mean uh, sort of you, you both load the HTML code from Gmail, but it also runs JavaScript code and style sheets and videos and images, all kinds of stuff going on in this tab on behalf of Gmail. And what makes this an interesting security problem is that you're not only browsing Gmail, you're also visiting lots of other sites. So maybe you'll visit your bank like MIT FCU, the credit union, .org, I suppose. So that also might be another tab that you have open. And that also has HTML and JavaScript coming from the MIT FCU website. And there might be lots of these tabs, and uh, some of them might actually be adversarial. Probably the attacker also has a website of his own, and maybe you visited the attacker website by accident. And it's important to keep these sites separate and have some plan uh, for keeping them apart. So in particular, if you've accidentally visited attacker.com, let's say, from the attacker's website, it would be really nice if this attacker website couldn't get the data from other pages that you have in your browser. Or it would be nice if the attacker couldn't get local files from your machine. So you probably have files on your computer outside the browser. Or if you have local applications. It would be nice if the code and uh, HTML on this attacker website that you're visiting couldn't steal anything there or affect it and uh, couldn't talk to other servers, should only talk to the attacker server, and so on. Does that make sense, sort of as the setting of why the, what the security problem is? So we want to be able to visit sites very much. Like at some level, the picture looks a lot like the mobile app security picture in Android and iOS, where you have your device and you're running lots of uh, code from different origins for different applications, uh, and you want to make sure they don't tamper with one another. Um, but sort of a messier answer than the kind of app isolation we saw in Android. Make sense? Questions? All right. So one thing that keeps coming up, or it's like a recurring question, is, uh, okay, how, how the hell did we get here? Uh, it's sort of a messy situation. Uh, so it's really a long story of evolution in some sense. Uh, the reason why this is a messy situation is because no one really understood what the web was going to be all at once, and we got here fairly incrementally. So the initial design was just text and images for the web, right? So you're going to have hyperlinked documents, and you might have documents linking to other documents. You might have images or other sort of uh, pictures, uh, but there wasn't really code or other sort of complicated state that you had to keep secure. So there wasn't really much of a security plan at all in the web browser. It didn't seem like there was anything sensitive going on on the web. It was all public documents linked to each other. And then sort of slowly the web evolved to have more interesting state that 
you might actually care about protecting. So uh, cookies came about uh, as a way of keeping state in your applications. So you can keep track of which user is doing what. Uh, the, before cookies came along, the web was pretty much stateless requests for documents. And just to give some sense, like cookies came around in 1994. And interestingly, cookies actually came about before JavaScript even came about. So first, you had websites with cookies where the cookies were used to identify which user was requesting a particular page. Um, and then uh, JavaScript came about on Netscape as a way of running code in 1995. Um, and that certainly created a lot of security questions now. Uh, now that you're running code inside of these uh, boxes in your browser, you need to figure out how to prevent them from doing bad stuff. Um, but initially, this didn't seem like that bad of a problem, partly because you know, people didn't quite appreciate what uh, important stuff was going to happen in a web browser. So initially, JavaScript was just used for sort of local animations or sort of some little automation. Uh, but then slowly, as you can imagine, right, we got more sensitive applications. So things like your email client showed up in your browser, maybe your bank, et cetera. And all of a sudden, there was something worth protecting. And in general, uh, there was quite a bit of rapid evolution, meaning that uh, new applications and new browser feature, new browser features came about, and uh, that was really the driving force rather than security. And I'm not proposing that security should have been like the, the main thing. Security was the goal. The web wouldn't have happened. It's much more secure without it. But um, this is sort of the under, to, to understand why we got into a mess situation, this is sort of the, the story. We, we really didn't know where we were headed as we were developing the web. Um, so what all of this means is that much of the web security mechanisms that you read about and saw are really retrofits. What I mean by this is that um, security problems were discovered or showed up, and we had to figure out how to fix them, but half of the design was already fixed. Like when JavaScript showed up, we already had a design for some of the web. We had a design for cookies already. We couldn't really change that. And uh, similarly, when we started having email or other sensitive stuff, a lot of the previous stuff was already designed. It was kind of hard to change as a result. There wasn't really a point where we sat down and uh, cooked up a sensible design. So much of this uh, security uh, plan is constrained by the fact that we had to retroactively add it on. And compatibility is a pretty big constraint in web security where uh, it's not really feasible for Chrome to come out and say, we're going to prohibit HTTP. We're going to prohibit certain kinds of cookies. We're going to prohibit cross-origin requests of a certain form. That's going to break a bunch of sites, and people are going to stop using Chrome. So that's why this kind of stuff doesn't really happen. Um, to some extent, it happens where you know things are particularly egregious, but not very much. Um, the other aspect that makes the web uh, sort of hard to evolve or tricky to evolve is the fact that there's many different browsers, and they sort of change over time. Like now there's probably Safari and Chrome, and maybe Firefox are the main browsers. Previously, there were other browsers that mattered, and there's not a single person or organization in charge. And maybe the last sort of constraint is that there's just a lot of sharing in the web by design. So in contrast to how you have Android apps or iOS apps that are pretty well isolated and just work by themselves, on the web, it's kind of expected that you can just like click on a link and go to another side, or you can uh, <laughs> embed one side into another side. You can have all kinds of interactions that you wouldn't have expect, you wouldn't expect, or aren't allowed in other contexts like mobile apps. So it's kind of a challenging environment, both in terms of what we want to achieve and in terms of the constraints placed on uh, how we got there. Make sense? Sort of questions? Just as some background for how we got here and why this is so messy. All right, so let's try to understand how do we more sort of systematically think about web security. And let's start with a threat model. What is web security? So for the purposes of this lecture, at least, what we're going to focus on is the security problem inside of the web browser on your computer. We'll talk about other aspects of web security, like the things going on over the network in later lectures. Uh, but for now, the main problem for us is going to be the user has a browser. And the assumption for much of web security is that the victim here, the user with a browser, somehow is going to visit the attacker's website, attacker.com, let's say. 
And the attacker, of course, has their own website, you know, attacker.com, or maybe not so obviously named, uh, that they can use in order to mount whatever attacks they want to do against our browser. Uh, so that's one assumption, is that you somehow got to the attacker's website, and you need to provide security in that context. Is this a reasonable assumption or not? Can we just avoid visiting bad websites? And sometimes you get this advice, like, don't click on funny links in your email messages. Is that a good idea? Is that enough? Any thoughts? Yeah. I see. Yeah, so you're saying, okay, so like the URL itself is like not particularly informative. Like could be a.com, could be a serialk.com, could be b.com. I don't know. Is that good or bad? Uh, but indeed, uh, I guess the other thing to think about is that many sites uh, include ads or other sort of third-party content. So I can probably pay, I don't know, 10 bucks and get my random site on newyorktimes.com for a small fee. And it'll load in your browser if you visit that popular site. Or same with Facebook. I can post an ad on Facebook, etc. Um, so it seems like a fairly inevitable part of the threat model. Um, the other part that matters is that uh, it's not only the attacker in this browser, uh, but probably other sites that you visited. So maybe you visited Gmail or your bank or what have you. And now we now have a security problem because we have the attacker and other important sites in the same browser. Now we've got to cook up a plan. So this is the threat model, if you will. You visited a bad site, and you've also visited other sites that you don't want compromised. And as I mentioned, the focus is really what's going on in the browser. And in particular, the kind of assumptions we're going to make is that the browser is trusted. So this means that it's not like you've walked up to a random PC in some internet cafe. It's your computer. You know it's good. It's not trying to fool you. Uh, and moreover, the browser is bug-free, for this lecture at least. Surely there's bugs in the browser. We even read this Errol box paper about how to avoid bugs in the browser. But let's just talk about the design of what should happen in the browser separate from how we go about implementing it correctly. And the other thing that we'll talk about for this lecture is that the network is going to be trusted. So we're not going to worry so much uh, about what happens if the adversary sniffs on the wireless network or you know, breaks into some server, etc. We're going to really worry about the client-side story here. Make sense? Questions so far? All right, so that's the plan for web security. Let's try to understand what is the plan, like inside of the browser, what is this trusted browser going to do for us to try to isolate these different sites from each other? And the whole plan revolves around this idea of an origin as a unit of isolation, if you will. Uh, so the origin is an identifier of what sort of the website is, some, some sort of a principal name, if you will. So if you have a, a URL, so an origin is sort of a function of a URL, uh, maybe easiest to understand. So if you have a URL like httpmail.google.com, slash, I don't know, mail, slash, you know, attachment, whatever. So if that's the URL, we can get an origin from it, and the origin is really the protocol, the host name, and a port number. So in this URL, the port number is sort of implicit. It's like port 443 by default for HTTPS. Uh, but this is what an origin is. And this is going to form the basis of many security decisions in the browser. We're going to talk about some code running on behalf of a certain origin or some resource belonging to an origin. And this is going to help us decide if they're in the same security domain or isolation box, if you will, or they're different. So one thing you can sort of conclude from this uh, already is that much of the stuff after the host name is irrelevant. Like the, the path name isn't really part of the security plan for much of the same origin policy. What matters is really w what the host name and port and protocol are. Uh, but within that site, everything is sort of in the same bucket as far as the security plan goes. Make sense? 
So what's the, how does this same origin, how does this origin actually get used in the browser? Well, this is the same origin policy that you read about. So the plan for the same origin policy, I, okay, I, sh I should say the same origin policy is sort of a fuzzy aspirational statement, if you will. It's not super precise, but it gives you some intuition of what should happen. And, you know, we'll talk about exactly what it means and various exceptions to it. Uh, but the high level plan is that we have some things in our browser that are going to cause stuff to happen that are going to like try to poke at sites or other resources. And then we have all those resources that might be poked. And that's the question we have to answer. Can this guy poke this resource? Uh, so what are the things that are doing the poking? Like the process in an operating system sense is the thing that makes a system call or tries to perform some operation. The equivalent in the web world is roughly a web page in your browser. And more precisely, it's either a tab or something called an iframe. We'll talk about that in a bit. Uh, but that's sort of the unit of execution. Uh, a web page can do stuff in your browser, can ask for stuff to be done. Uh, and it can do so in many ways. Of course, you can have JavaScript code that runs inside of a page, kind of like code running inside of a process in an operating system. Uh, but you also might have other things in a page, like HTML elements that ask the browser to load an image or do other things. And this is also considered to be part of a page requesting something to be done. So that's the, that's the thing doing the action. And there's a flip side of it as what is it acting on? So what are the resources that the same origin policy has to protect? Well, the resources that you might worry about in a browser are things like the page itself. So it's represented by this document object model. Um, so parts of your page itself. So who can modify the page that the user is seeing on their screen. Um, cookies, we'll talk about them in more detail later. Of course, uh, the network servers that you can talk to are something you might want to protect. You might not want to control what the code in your browser can do in terms of talking to other things over the network, um, and so on. So the plan for the same origin policy is, roughly speaking, to figure out what's the origin of this guy based on the URL of the web page that is running. And then we're going to also assign an origin to the resource, which uh, sometimes is obvious, sometimes less so obvious. But uh, we're going to pin an origin on every resource that we care about. And the question is, if this web page tries to go access a resource, then in order to answer that, the at least plan at the high level is these guys better be the same. If the page is trying to poke a resource from the same origin, that's OK. That's going to be allowed. If the page is trying to, I don't know, poke a cookie, get a cookie, or talk to a network server from a different origin, that's not OK. So that's the aspiration for web security. Make sense? Question. So is it sufficient to make the origin based on the URL itself? Um, it's kind of, I don't know how to answer the question. It's like, you know, it's a fact of life now, uh, whether it's sufficient or not. Like, you shouldn't be using it in a way that makes it insufficient, I suppose. Uh, so there are some in, in, incongruences. Maybe you're thinking about cookies in particular. Uh, so cookies came about before JavaScript, which made some of this stuff funny looking. Uh, so cookies have a path component, and the same origin policy came about later. And basically said, let's ignore the path part of cookies for security purposes. Uh, so be it. Uh, but uh, there are some uh, like implications. So for example, if I host my website on MIT.edu, or well, that's kind of odd, because all of you guys are also hosting your websites on MIT.edu, potentially, or you could. You write any code you want. So I can't really have anything sensitive or secret or protected on my MIT web page, because you could pull up your page in that some, someone's browser, and you could go access my page as DOM elements in that victim's browser. So, well, you know, yeah, indeed, that's uh, MIT started hosting web pages before this stuff sort of <laughs> got pinned down, uh, and ma many other sites did as well. Uh, but indeed, if you actually care about security, you need to get your own domain name or your own host name at the very least. But for reasons we'll talk about later, probably even a top-level domain name as well is needed just for security. Like it's actually not secure to co-host different people's web websites on the same domain. Very much like you wouldn't want to run your code in the same process as someone else's code that you don't trust. Uh, 
Yeah, so, so you know, hosting personal websites in the same domain. It's like an, a bit of an anachronism if you think about it. Like, I do it, but uh, I, I don't put anything terribly interesting there. Yeah. Other questions? Yeah. Yeah, okay, so are, there, are people trying to evolve this stuff? So, you know, yeah, there's evolution happening, right? So the, 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 the stuff is actually pretty fast moving in some ways, uh, but there are serious constraints. Like, you can't really break existing sites too much, and you have to get all the browsers to go together. You can't really break sharing or linking between sites very much, otherwise things will break. Um, maybe the closest example of what you're asking about, how do you add better security, is the content security policy that you read about. So that is an example of a feature that is opt-in, so it's pretty good for compatibility. Uh, it lets a site protect itself if the developer of that site knows they're not going to require any features that would have been broken by that. Uh, and, uh, you know, browsers slowly opted into the same plan over time, and now it's pretty widely deployed and used by many sites. Uh, but yeah, it takes a, you, know, you have to sort of make your security mechanism look and look, fit all these constraints in order to get it uh, added. Um, so, so things do happen, and there's other improvements you read about probably for how cookies get sent along, uh, but well, it's sort of hard, hard to change the default plan. Uh, yeah. Other questions? All right. So... That's sort of the same origin policy. So just to give you one example of how the same origin policy applies, uh, let's talk about a fairly widely used API. Uh, in a web browser, you can call XML HTTP request in order to ask the browser in your JavaScript code to talk to some server on your behalf. So if we are a user with a browser, we might be visiting multiple different sites, and here we might have some site, maybe a.com, our attacker. If the attacker asks to do XHR on a URL that's a.com, for example, then the browser will say, yeah, sure, you're from a.com, you're trying to get a page from a.com, you can talk to a.com server behind the scenes. And it'll actually allow the JavaScript code in your browser in a.com's tab to talk to some server on the network whenever it wants uh, on your behalf. Uh, but... Uh, if this guy tries to issue an XHR request to, I don't know, gmail.com, for example, well, the browser is going to say no. That's a different origin. You're not allowed to do that. There's a little bit more to the story. There's this cross-origin request sharing uh, that you read about. So actually what's going to happen is the browser will actually send a request to Gmail and ask, do you want to talk to a.com? Do you want to allow this cross-origin request? And if Gmail says no, then the browser will say, oh, yeah, no, you're not allowed. Uh, but it's sort of Gmail's option to allow these requests. But, of course, if you are also visiting Gmail in your browser, then you also have a tab from Gmail. If that tab makes the same request, xhr onto gmail.com, that's going to be allowed because now that is the same origin. So it really sort of depends who is asking to talk to Gmail in your browser uh, for the purpose of deciding if that's going to be okay. Make sense? Hopefully somewhat clear. All right. So let's talk about sort of all the things. This is sort of about as much as like is clear and unambiguous and fits the same origin policy very well. Uh, so let's start talking about all the sort of exceptions or things that don't quite fit in the same way. Uh, maybe starting with cookies. So cookies are pretty crucial for HTTP and web applications because they're the main mechanism by which servers can identify which client is issuing a request. So if you have a server like Gmail, it gets requests from many different users and needs to tell which user is actually asking. And you don't want to ask the user for their username and password on every single request. So the usual plan is that uh, the browser is going to store a giant table of cookies. So the main things to think about is it's a big table with a domain name, a key, and a value. It's like a key value store for cookies from different origins or different domains. Uh, so when your browser goes and talks to some server like, let's say, mail.google.com, 
the site might ask you to log in, you might type in your username, password, your U2F, two-factor authentication, and once everything works out, once you're logged in, what's going to happen is that the server is going to send a cookie to your web browser, and it's a header, basically, in your HTTP response that says, set cookie, and it says, you know, maybe the cookie name is SID, and the value is some random string. It's a random session ID that you've now logged in. So I don't know, 2, 3, 5, X, Z, whatever. So what's going to happen is that the server is going to remember this random session ID that it sent to your browser. So somewhere on the server, there's probably a big table that says, here's the session ID that is random, and here's the user that is logged in inside of that session ID. So the session ID that we're just sending, X, whatever, Z, this might be user Alice on Gmail's server. And on the browser side, when it gets this cookie from the server, it's going to store it in its table of cookies. So it might actually store the domain name here, the, SI, the cookie name is SID, and the value is 235X something Z. And the domain could just come from the server name. So initially, uh, if, the, if the domain where you logged in or that set you the cookie is mail.google.com, that's the domain name that's going to be stuck in your table of cookies in your browser. And the other sort of important thing that happens with these cookies is whenever your browser sends a request to a server, it attaches all of the cookies from that domain. So in particular, if you then browse to mail.google.com again, either in the same session or you open your browser tomorrow, your browser is still going to remember all these cookies and it's going to send them. So it's going to send cookie, a header in your HTTP request, cookie SID equals, you know, this 235XZ, whatever value. And then when the server gets this cookie value from some HTTP request, it's going to look it up in the table and say, aha, that's a request from Alice because that's a random value I gave to Alice. No one else should know about it. So that's the sort of general plan for cookies. And the one thing that I, well, one of many things I've glossed over is that um, the server can actually sort of specify the domain for which the cookie should be set. So you might have logged in on mail.google.com, but it's actually your Google account. So if you went to maps.google.com or another Google service, you should still have the same session ID. So cookies can be set for a particular domain that's not just mail.google.com. You can actually say domain equals google.com, for example. And that will tell the browser to actually just store google.com in this table. So that's your cookie now for all of google.com. So that's okay. So the, the, the server can set a broader cookie, effectively becomes star.google.com. The server can ask for this cookie to be sent to more people than just exactly that same host name. That make sense? Questions about cookies in general? Yeah. Okay, so your question is, how do cookies interact with course origin requests? So, uh, and in particular, you're wondering, okay, if the cookies get sent along with this request to gmail.com, is that bad or not? Well, I don't know. Let's think about it. It might not be so bad because the cookie is secret, but Gmail, of course, knows your cookie value. So it's not a disaster to send your cookie value to Gmail. Gmail already knows this cookie. And it might know that, yeah, okay, well, some page on your browser from a.com is trying to talk to Gmail, but it can correctly respond that cross-origin requests are not allowed for Gmail, for example, if it wants to. Uh, and the adversary isn't going to learn your cookie as a result, and it's not going to be able to do anything particularly damaging with your cookie, other than learn that Gmail doesn't allow this victim user to talk to it through cores. So, if, 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 so now you're asking if the attacker tries to send a, a request to an attacker server. Oh, yeah, that's totally allowed by the same origin policy. And in fact, the attacker will get the attacker's cookies very much like they would if they were a legitimate site. I mean, they are a legitimate site in some sense. Uh, so, yeah, so th it does work this way. Yeah, question? Yeah, so let's talk about, I guess, the security plan for these cookies. We sort of didn't explicitly say this, but indeed, what is the interaction here? Uh, 
cookie security. So there's really sort of three interesting aspects to this. One is that the cookie is sent on all requests. So whenever a browser sends any HTTP request whatsoever, it's going to find all the matching cookies and send them along. Uh, there's going to be some exceptions, maybe. We'll see if we get to them. Uh, but this is the plan. So indeed, if you go to a page directly, if you type in a URL, it's going to load that page and send your cookies. If, if some page does an XHR request, the browser will attach the cookies for you. If you load an image from somewhere, the browser will attach the cookies for you. So the browser always helpfully sticks the cookies into every HTTP request uh, from the appropriate domain, of course. Like it's not going to send your Gmail cookies to attacker.com because that's not a cookie for attacker.com. It's going to attach the matching cookies from the table. Make sense? All right. So that's one part of the story of where cookies get sent. They get sent pretty much on a, 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 any browser request. Uh, the other part of the story is that in JavaScript, what if you want to access your cookies in JavaScript code? Well, roughly the plan is that, you know, it's okay if the origins match. So if you are JavaScript, if some JavaScript code running inside of your Gmail tab tries to access your Gmail cookies, that's okay. And there's some approximate here because your cookie might be for star.google.com. Your tab might be running in mail.google.com. The rule says that's okay. As long as your, the origin of your window or tab matches the domain of the cookie, it's going to be allowed. So that's the rule. And the last sort of one sort of annoying thing that's underspecified in cookies is actually who can set a cookie? Or I don't know. I shouldn't say maybe it's underspecified, but it's surprisingly complicated. So any guesses? What should be the rule for setting a cookie? Yeah? Okay, so certainly there's something about which server gave you the cookie that, that relates to who should be able to set it. So suppose I have my browser over here, um, and I'm visiting various sites. Like suppose I, uh, you know, visit a.com, our attacker, and a.com sends me a cookie. So it certainly should be able to set a cookie. You know, could set some session ID equals one two three, and could set you know domain equals a.com. That should be allowed. That's its own domain name. If it sets you know, gmail.com, that's going to be disallowed because that's not a suffix of its own domain name. That's just like a whole other domain, not allowed. You can, you can only, like, if, you, if you're mail.google.com, you can set a cookie for star.google.com. But you can't just go set a cookie for a different domain. So the same origin policy, or the cookie policy, says you cannot set a cookie for uh, basically an unrelated domain name in the browser. Does this make sense? What about setting a cookie for .com? Should this be allowed? Actually, maybe a better question is, suppose the browser allowed this. Would this be bad? Why would this be bad? Any guesses? Yeah? Okay, so your answer is, well, this is going to overlap with Gmail, which is certainly some part of the story. But you're saying, oh, well, if, I, if the attacker sets this cookie for .com, now the browser is going to send this cookie to both Gmail and a.com. Well, it's not a problem for it to send it to a.com because the attacker set it. There's no secret being leaked. And in, in fact, or we're assuming the browser doesn't sort of confuse the two cookies. If you already had a Gmail cookie, Maybe this takes precedence, or maybe the Gmail cookie takes precedence, but you wouldn't send the Gmail cookie to a.com as a result of this. You might just have this .com cookie that gets sent to every .com site. Seems like a slightly weird thing. Uh, any guesses why this might be undesirable? Yeah. Uh, 
I see. Okay. So, you, so your answer is, uh, it might be just like a super long cookie and maybe like over, like Gmail isn't expecting that long of a cookie. Maybe that'll cause some problems on Gmail's side. So that's a possible thought, but keep in mind that an adversary can just send a request to Gmail directly. It doesn't need the victim browser to do so. So if there's a buffer overflow in the cookie parsing code on Gmail, I'll just connect to Gmail and uh, do it like in lab one. Uh, so I don't really need this attack. Uh, yeah? Well, yeah, so, so indeed. So, so a.com could cause the browser to send requests to Gmail now with the attacker's cookie. And the reason this turns out to be problematic is uh, actually kind of subtle. Um, it's not a, it, the attacker could have sent this request with this cookie directly. So it's kind of subtle what's going on. The problem is that this might cause Gmail, for example, or Google.com uh, to associate later operations from this browser with the attacker's account. So suppose, G so suppose you're doing Google searches. Google is going to log the searches somewhere. It's going to lo log the searches into your account history. If this cookie is the attacker session, and this cookie gets sent to, with your request to Google to do a web search, Google will helpfully log your web search query under the attacker's account. And now the attacker can look in their account and see what you searched for. So this is, a, I guess, in the web security literature, there's a lot of buzzwords. Uh, this is, I think, called a session fixation attack. Or session fixing attack. So the problem is that later on, when you go to Google.com, for example, this cookie chosen by the adversary is going to be sent, and your search queries, for example, might get logged. Or if you send an email through Gmail, maybe it'll send it in the sent folder of the attacker instead of your, etc. So how do we fix this? Yeah? Yeah, indeed. So there's actually like a fairly complicated story to how to answer this question. And one naive answer might be, well, just like don't allow for .com. Don't allow for one letter domains. Uh, and it turns out that's not enough uh, because you might have domains like co.uk like in, in the United Kingdom. Uh, many, many sites like BBC lives as a third level domain, if you will. So it would be a similar bad thing if you could set a cookie for all of .co.uk. So there's not really a one-size-fits-all plan for how to decide if a cookie should be settable for any particular uh, suffix of your domain name. So .com is bad, but also .co.uk is bad. Another example is actually like Massachusetts has its own domain. So like there's public schools in Massachusetts have k12.ma.us, and each public school has its own domain name there. Like cambridge.k12.ma.us. It's like sometimes setting a cookie for this is also bad. Like, so <laughs> it's a mess. You can't actually tell whether a cookie should be settable for some domain suffix just based on the number of dots here. And instead, there's this rather sort of hair-raising thing called the public suffix list. This is a giant list of suffixes like .com and .co.uk and .k12.ma.us that uh, all the browser vendors together maintain. And if you have some domain name that you don't think uh, should have cookies set on it, you go talk to these guys and say, hey, you know, please add this to the public suffix list. Every browser ships with a copy of this thing and uses that to decide whether it's okay to set a cookie on that suffix. Uh, so this is a, sort of a messy answer to this question of who can set a cookie, but actually it sort of came about as a surprise. People didn't really realize that setting a cookie on some suffix of a domain name mattered. But then someone realized, ah, you can like actually get someone's Google searches by forcing them into your Google account. And then people realize, ah, shoot, we need this public suffix list kind of a thing. Uh, entity in every browser. Make sense? Questions? So this is the sort of plan for cookie security. Uh, sort of makes sense, at least on the reading side. On the writing side, there's this public suffix list uh, mess. Uh, but uh, that's how cookies work. So now let's talk about uh, various exceptions to the same origin policy to understand where some problems might lie or why the same origin policy doesn't quite do everything for us. And one maybe symptom you should be seeing already 
is that the same origin policy seems pretty strict if you take it literally, because it seems to suggest that multiple sites just cannot interact with each other at all. There should be no way, like, yeah. I can't link to another site at all in the web. I can't do anything cross-site because they're different origins. So necessarily, there's going to be a whole bunch of exceptions to the same origin policy. And the most obvious one is uh, links. So it's actually allowed in the same origin policy for any site, like a.com, for example, to have a link to another site. So you can have actually a link that says, you know, a href https gmail.com. So that's totally allowed in the same origin policy and sort of makes sense why, you know, or historically makes sense. I guess the goal was to allow linking between pages and this supports that and makes many applications convenient to use. You can click on links. Um, so that's a important exception to the same origin policy. Uh, but it interacts with our security mechanisms in some funny ways already, right? So of course, when you click on a link, all the cookies that do get sent from your browser. So some page like attacker.com can cook up a link to Gmail and you might click on it. Maybe you're not, I don't know, maybe that's really what you want to do. But now your browser is gonna take the link that the attacker supplied that you didn't really type in or necessarily choose on your own and it's gonna send all your cookies that identify your account along with that request. So that already should seem kind of slightly strange to you or slightly worrisome from a security perspective. Um, so it's not just that you can click on links, but that now the attacker is choosing where you go with your own cookies. Question? Yeah, so it will send the cookies that match the URL that you're going to, the, of the page you're opening. Uh, absolutely, yeah. It's not going to send the attacker's cookies uh, to Gmail as a result of this link. Make sense? Questions? Yeah. Why is that bad? Yeah, so um, one problem might be that an adversary might give you a link that has some side effect, right? So this is a page that probably is okay to load, but suppose you had a URL on your, I don't know, local printer on your network that like printed something. Well, the attacker could type that URL as a link and give it to you and you might click on it and maybe now it'll cause your printer to print something or maybe it'll like change your temperature in your thermostat if that has an HTTP server in your home. Or maybe it'll, like, maybe here on MIT's network, you're behind MIT's firewall and attackers generally can't connect to other machines on MIT's campus because there's some firewall blocking those requests. We'll talk about network security later, I guess. Uh, but if the attacker gets you to click on this link, that might cause your browser to send a request to some internal MIT machine that, uh, you know, might in turn be problematic because that MIT machine wasn't expecting to get a certain requests from the adversary, and now it'll trick your browser into sort of funneling that request to some internal MIT machine. Um, so we'll look at a more concrete example in a bit, yeah. Other questions? All right, so another exception to the same origin policy has to do with content. So not just links, but uh, attackers or any websites can actually include content from other origins. So you can have an image that says, you know, please load this image from HTTPS, I don't know, foo.com slash x.gif some kind of an image, and that's also allowed by the same origin policy. The use case, or sort of the, the motivation for why this is useful to allow is because you might not want to copy a bunch of images that are already available somewhere else. It'll be great to just reuse images from other servers. You don't have to uh, create copies of lots of images on your domain if they're already available elsewhere. So the same origin policy says this is okay. One, thing you should maybe worry about now is uh, what happens if this loading this image requires your cookies. So maybe, well, maybe I should say, first of all, the browser, again, helpfully sends your cookies along with such requests. So if this is a public image, this seems fine in a sense, module the fact that this is maybe an internal URL to your printer or something. Uh, but uh, aside from that, uh, if this is a public URL, 
that's eh, not, a, not a huge deal. But it might be that this URL is only accessible because of your cookies. Like maybe this is a URL of some attachment in your Gmail folder. And then fetching that image is only going to be allowed if your cookies are sent along with the request. The attacker can send that request and can't fetch that image, but your browser can. So it's possible for an adversary to potentially have a web page of their own, a.com, that loads some image that the adversary couldn't have loaded on their own, but it shows up in the adversary's page now. That's a slightly weird thing. Uh, one thing the same origin policy does to make this not a big disaster is that code in a page actually cannot look at how the page looks like. So even though you might have JavaScript code running in a.com's tab in a user's browser, that JavaScript code cannot look at the pixels of that page because the pixels might have actually come from some origin that the attacker isn't allowed to see. So the same origin policy, surprisingly enough, says that, or at least the, the security plan, I don't know if it's the same origin policy saying it, but the security plan for the browser is that a tab or a window can't actually introspect its own appearance or pixels. It can only sort of generate HTML elements or DOM elements and make the browser load some images, can't actually look at the result because that would leak data from other origins. Make sense? Question. Yeah, so the Canvas API, uh, okay, the question is like, how does it interact with the Canvas? You can use the Canvas API to draw stuff, but you can't load an image into a Canvas. Uh, and uh, if you, and so you can only read what you wrote yourself in the Canvas. You can't uh, use the Canvas to look at the contents of another image that came from outside the Canvas, if that makes sense. I think there are some restrictions that basically I think the real answer is there's a bunch of special cases. Uh, so if you load a cross-origin image into a canvas, that canvas becomes, I think, now tainted, and now you can't read its contents, or at least not the pixels that you loaded in. Uh, and it's kind of a messy situation. One thing that uh, does actually leak about these images, okay, so, so the same origin policy prohibits the website from looking at the contents of these cross-origin images, but the dimensions leak which is kind of bizarre, meaning that the parent page that loaded a cross-origin image can tell what the dimensions of the image are because it can manipulate the layout of the page and it can see that, oh, something is taking up 800 pixels by 600 pixels on my page. Uh, so it's kind of a strange security policy. If you host any secret data, you should know that an adversary can get the dimensions of your secret image. So you better not have anything secret dependent in the dimensions. Uh, but the contents, the same version policy tries to keep secret. That's kind of a very weird policy, if that makes sense. Questions about this exception? All right, and maybe the last exception along these lines that I want to mention is actually scripts themselves. So the way you load JavaScript code is that some page, like a.com, can actually ask the browser to load some JavaScript code from a certain URL and uh, the intended use case is that I might want to use some common JavaScript library code, like maybe some CDN that hosts jQuery. And the browser will load that URL for me uh, and execute the JavaScript code in the context of my page. So here, one subtlety in how the same origin policy applies is that this JavaScript code is going to run in the origin of the page that loaded and executed it. So the way to think of it is that this JavaScript code is not going to run in the origin of cdn.com, but instead it's going to run in the origin of a.com. It's kind of like a process loading a shared library. I'm going to, in a.com, I'm going to run this code in my origin. It has now my privileges. So if there's some, you know, funny JavaScript code that tries to do something undesirable, well, it's going to run in a.com's origin and now have access to a.com's resources, if you will. Make sense? Any questions about these sort of exceptions to this policy? Yeah.
Okay, so your, your question is like, uh, when can you access the content of the data from another origin? So uh, the story is sort of as follows. Uh, if you're from, a, I guess, the same origin, you can do XHR requests. You can get all the data. If the other origin has a cross-origin uh, policy that says it's okay to get this data, then you can get the data through XHR as if it was or your origin. And if none of these apply, then these are the things you can do. You could try to load this blob as a GIF file, and if it parses as a GIF, you'll learn its dimensions, and you can draw it. Or if it parses as JavaScript, you can run that code in your context. Now, it's kind of weird exceptions, but you have to be a little bit careful. So for example, if there's some secret data that you're hosting in a website that might accidentally parse as valid JavaScript, then an adversary could load it and infer what it was by the effect that it had on its JavaScript environment. So many sites uh, used to prefix sensitive data with some like a JavaScript infinite loop. So if you accidentally, or if some adversary tries to load the sensitive data from another origin, using a script tag, what will happen is that browser will start running this JavaScript code, and it should basically start with some kind of, I forget what the convention is, but it's something like while true curly brace. And if you ever, if you try to infer what's in that file, you'll first block your JavaScript interpreter. Uh, uh, that's like the, the suggested way to do this, uh, because otherwise the same origin policy does let you request this stuff. Um, so those are the kind of workarounds you get into if you yeah, don't have a clearer plan. Yeah. Make sense? I think there was another question, maybe? Or you're good? All right. Sounds good. Question. Okay, so the question is just to repeat uh, is, if, if I'm logged into Gmail and I open an attacker page, and somehow the attacker knows the URL of my attachment in Gmail and has this image source tag in their attacker page, then yeah, it'll actually load the attachment from Google. It'll show the attachment in their page. Now, as we were talking about like five minutes ago, the attacker's JavaScript cannot introspect on the pixels of that image. It can just show it in their page. And the way Gmail, I believe, in particular deals with this is they actually make their attachment URLs unpredictable. There's like a random blob in the URL that prevents people from guessing it. But this is sort of what you have to do is you have to actually put some random thing in the URL itself so that no one can guess it because the cookie itself isn't enough. Someone can ask the browser to send the cookie on its behalf. Make sense? All right. So let's talk about some attacks in web security and... Now, I think we understand basically all the machinery of what the browser does. Let's talk about how it goes wrong. And maybe the first uh, example of how it goes wrong uh, has to do exactly with this problem of sending cookies with every request. So the attack I want to describe, you've probably read about, is called cross-site request forgery, or CSRF. CSRF. So the setup for this attack is roughly the following. So I'm logged into my bank, let's say, and I accidentally visit an attacker site. So in my browser, what's going on? So this is my web browser. The adversary puts an image tag. So it might be something like image source equals, and the URL might be bank.com slash transfer. And it'll have question mark, you know, amount is 100. And the recipient is the attacker. So if the attacker's website has this image tag, it's going to cause my browser to send this request to bank.com. And the request is just going to say, this URL, that's fetching an image with a certain URL, that's going to say, you know, slash X for, you know, question mark amount is something, and, uh, you know, the two is something else. So if this was a bank that I was logged into, my browser would helpfully also attach my cookies. So it would actually say, you know, cookie, here is, you know, SID is equal to the victim's SID. 
So this looks like, a, you know, I'm sort of guessing various things, but uh, in terms of what a bank request might look like, but uh, it might be the case that for a bank, this is exactly the request that the bank uses to transfer money to a different account. And as far as the bank is concerned, this request came with the session ID of the victim user, so it was from the victim, and it's asking to transfer money. Uh, so many web applications used to be, I'm sure some are still vulnerable to such attacks, where an adversary can cause the victim's browser to send requests that the victim didn't intend. Does this make sense? So the result is that just sending this request to the bank might cause the bank to have some side effect. Uh, and it's actually coming seem seemingly from the victim. Make sense? Question. Okay, yeah, yeah. So the, the, the question is, is this a get request or something else? So you're right, for an image tag, this would be a get. And for modern sites, probably they wouldn't approve a get with this. Uh, but another exception that looks almost the same as the image exception is that you can have a form. Action equals the same URL. And then you can have a cross-origin form. And you can submit a cross-origin form, very much like you can load a cross-origin image. And then it'll be a post request. So you don't actually get out of this mess by just relying on the fact that it's a get request. Uh, you can use a form tag instead of an image tag to cause an attacker site to send a post request to another origin with the origins cookies. Make sense? All right, so how do we defend against this attack? So there's a, a pretty standard plan for how to deal with these cross-origin request forgeries. Uh, it involves basically another secret blob uh, that uh, isn't going to be available to the adversary. So the usual defense for these cross-origin request forgeries is something called a CSRF token. So the way this is going to work is that the real bank application isn't going to require just the cookie. It's going to actually want a little bit more from the victim's browser in order to really authenticate the transfer. And the way this is going to work is that the bank website, let's say bank.com here, is going to have an extra uh, uh, secret value in addition to the session ID that's going to be called a token. And when the user legitimately loads the bank website in their browser. So again, this is the victim's browser here. When the user legitimately goes to the bank website, the bank actually, well, sends a website, web page, of course, but inside of the page is this secret token value. And it's actually not a cookie header, it's part of the web page itself. One way you can think of it is that inside of the web page is some JavaScript blob that says var token equals one, seven, three, whatever. It's like a secret blob inside of the web page. And the rule is the bank is going to require this token to be sent along with the transfer request. So behind the scenes, the bank is storing all these tokens. So for every user, there's a table in the bank that says, here's the tokens that I've generated for that user. So if the user is Alice, here's that token, one, seven, three, something. And when a request comes back, then the expectation is that, of course, there's a cookie attached, but also in the transfer arguments, you have to have you know, the amount, like we were guessing before, and the recipient, and the token is going to have to be equal to this value, 173, whatever. That's specific for each user, has a different token. And if this token matches what's in this table, then this request is going to be allowed. Now let's talk about a couple of things. One is, how do we actually arrange for this to happen? How do we actually get the token into the request? Well, the page, bank, the real bank.com page, has access to the token. It's a JavaScript variable. It can use this variable when it constructs this request. It can use XML HTTP requests to send this request to the bank if it wants, when you fill out the transfer form or whatever it is on the bank website. So it's no problem for the real bank to get this token value and to add it into its transfer request. But for the adversary to get it now requires actually violating the same origin policy. 
The reason why is that the only place this token appears is in the content of the bank website for that user. So in order to get this token, the adversary would have to somehow look at the contents of this web page. The same origin policy prevents that. Even if you're running, even if you have another tab with the attacker site open in that same browser, let's say, the same origin policy says the attacker can't reach inside of this web page and look at those JavaScript variables or other DOM elements. And the only thing you can do is send that transfer request with the cookie, but without the token. So basically, the CSRF token is bypassing these cookie rules and instead manually sending the token that's now subject to exactly the same origin policy, not any cookie policy. And that ensures that only the real bank can tack this token onto the real request. Make sense? So in this case, the attacker pulls off the attack, they don't have, or tries to pull it off, they don't have the token to authenticate the request. Questions? All right. So I should say these cross-site request forgeries have been pretty prevalent. It's like one of the two main security problems on the web, if you will. Uh, uh, but uh, many web frameworks now try to include the CSRF token defense as part of the web framework itself. So the, the web framework like Django or Flask or whatever might actually have support for uh, keeping this table of tokens and generating this token that gets sent to the client and adding it on requests, etc. That's like a fairly standard library that you might use if you're building a web application. All right, so that's one common security problem in web applications. Um, one other thing that I wanted to mention is uh, maybe another, not quite a security problem, but an interesting exception to the same origin policy uh, is iframes. And that's a sort of iframe is a particular mechanism, but it's used for embedding content. And the problem that iframes try to solve is if I want to embed some element, some data or some content from another site into my page, that's more interesting than just, let's say, an image or uh, some other file. So the example might be I have some website, like a.com, maybe an attacker, maybe not, but maybe I want to embed a YouTube video. So YouTube video is not just an image tag. As there's like complicated stuff, it needs to run some JavaScript code to render the video, to seek back and forth, etc. How does this work? Well, there's a special element called an iframe that I can include in the page of something like a.com, and it will cause the browser to actually load another origin and run another origin's page inside of this frame, inside of the parent site. So here the rules are the top level page, of course, can talk to a.com because that's the origin. But the inner frame, this iframe for YouTube, can actually talk to youtube.com. So you can have this interesting situation where I basically like, spawned a little process from YouTube and it's running YouTube's code with YouTube's origin and can do everything a YouTube page would be able to do, but it's sort of part of my page. So this uh, sort of maybe explains what I meant here by the entity doing the operations in a browser is not just a top-level tab. could be an inner iframe. So here the situation is that even though the request is coming from a tab that's open to a.com's URL, the principal doing the request is actually the YouTube.com origin of the iframe itself. This can access YouTube's cookies, send requests, get data, get responses, all that stuff. Uh, so that's the iframe mechanism. Yeah, question? In different, uh, the question is, are these in different sandboxes? You mean like OS level isolation sandboxes for the browser? Yeah, so iframes are a big pain for browser developers because they can't put the tab into a single origin sandbox because it touches so many different origins. Uh, so indeed, uh, you 
This is the reason why many browsers historically haven't had a sandbox that's tied to an origin. The sandbox's goal in a browser, this is slightly a bit of an aside, but the sandbox for the browser process of a particular tab, the goal was really to prevent it from accessing local files that it shouldn't access, but not to do any kind of origin level separation for partly this reason. And there's some new support in Chrome and I think Firefox for site level sandboxing or per origin sandboxes. Uh, that required much more work to disentangle the side frame. So then like there's one process for a.com, another process running for youtube.com here, and somehow you combine their pixels. That's a complicated story now. Ah, okay, so someone sent you a link that exploited a browser bug. Well, okay, so one thing I should say is, like, this lecture is not about browser bugs. We assume that for this lecture, the threat model is browser is bug-free. Uh, browser sandboxes do try to deal with that, and uh, per-origin sandboxes try to deal with the problem you mentioned of someone sends you a link in one origin, and can that leak cookies of other origins? Uh, but let's sort of ignore that discussion for now, uh, sort of beside the point in some sense. Uh, with respect to at least the, the, the plan that the browser is trying to implement uh, separate from uh, bugs in its implementation. Yeah. All right. But does the iframe mechanism make sense? So one sort of surprising thing that these iframes give rise to is this attack that you saw in the readings called clickjacking, where uh, one thing that... Basically, the browser developers didn't really understand that they were doing is that by having iframes, you now create some ambiguity about what the user was interacting with when they clicked on a page. So the particular attack that can take place in a browser now is that you might have a top-level page you're visiting that happens to be malicious, like an attacker, a.com. It creates an iframe for another site, like Amazon, and Amazon has a nice buy button to buy something on its page. And Amazon might be thinking, well, if the user clicks the buy button, I should assume that the user clicked on it. So that's sort of the user's, they, they wanted to buy something. And the problem with these clickjacking attacks, or sort of what some security researcher realized, is that the user might click the buy button, but maybe the buy button wasn't even visible at the time. So one problem might be that when a.com creates this iframe, one property you can set on HTML elements, like an iframe, is its opacity. Like, you can have a transparent element. You can have a transparent image. You can also set a transparent iframe. So you can load Amazon in one of these iframes, like you're embedding a YouTube video, but you can actually specify this whole thing should be transparent. So it's not actually being rendered, but as far as the browser is concerned, there is a buy button here. So now the only thing the attacker site has to do is to draw something underneath of this buy button on its page that's actually being seen through the transparent Amazon page, and ask the user, hey, you know, please click this button to, I don't know, do something, go next. And then when the user clicks on it, the browser interprets this as a click on the iframe, on this button. Uh, and this ends up being kind of an annoyance. You know, in the case of Amazon, you know, maybe you trick the user into clicking on a buy button you didn't want. The most prevalent form of this attack is actually... Uh, sort of attacking like buttons for Facebook. So if someone's goal is to generate lots of likes on a page, they can't really generate likes themselves from their Facebook account. They can only, I guess, like it once per user account they have. But they can load pages like this and use clickjacking to load Facebook's page with a like button right there and convince the user to click on the like button. And this way, the user might not even realize they're liking some Facebook page in the process. Uh, but this way, the attacker can collect lots of fake likes on pages. So this is an annoyance for many websites as well. Um, does the attack make sense? Questions about the attack? Yeah, question. So the, the, the iframe works, uh, yeah, like a separate process effectively. So the domain is YouTube or whatever, Amazon, that's the domain of the iframe. When it sends cookies, of course, it sends the cookies, but it can also operate as if this was the top-level tab. It can get responses. It's as if YouTube.com is running as YouTube.com, or same as Amazon or any other, or Facebook in this case. So it's as if it's, all, it's, it's not running with the privileges of the top-level process, of the top-level page, 
Uh, the iframe is sort of a security boundary, creates a sub-process, if you will. So here, the cookie is the bank.com cookie. So this is the cookies for bank.com. So the rule is always, if you're sending an HTTP request, you send the cookies for that host name that you're sending the request to. It, yeah. If it's an origin that's different from yours, you wouldn't be able to get the response back with XHR, so you might have to do an image source, etc. cetera. Uh, but yeah, the cookies are always with the target host. Make sense? All right, so the defense for this turns out to be like an extra uh, header or a flag that a, a web page can set. So if a page like Amazon doesn't want to be subject to these click checking attacks, it has to basically prohibit itself from being loaded in, into an iframe. That sort of works okay for Amazon. Like you probably, it doesn't make sense for Amazon to allow embedding it into other web pages. YouTube can't really do this. So YouTube actually worries a lot about click jacking when it's being embedded. So it might not actually let you like a YouTube video or might treat those likes as suspect if the like is generated through an embedded YouTube video. Uh, for other websites, this might not be actually a reasonable defense at all. Like if some web page wants to be embedded but also wants to have a Facebook like button here, well, you know, now it's Facebook's problem and it's not clear what Facebook should do about that uh, because the, the page really might want to be embedded uh, and maybe Facebook can you know, treat those likes suspiciously or what have you, but not super clear. So there's like some categorical defenses if you just don't want to be embedded at all. But if you do want to be embedded, you don't really know if something was overlaid on top of you or not. Uh, it's hard to really know. Question. Um, well, you know, yeah, sometimes, I mean, there's like lots of visual stuff uh, that people do on the web. Like you might want to embed a YouTube video, but like the whole site, I don't know, has a winter theme. There's like snowflakes dropping through the whole page. I don't know, people do all kinds of stuff on the web, man. Uh, I don't know why, but like, you know, it's a fact of, or, uh, the feature seems to be important to some class of users or developers. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, so I think it's uh, like the composition of features. So I think no one probably was thinking, ah, well, we'll have iframes and we'll allow overlaying on iframes. I doubt that was the discussion at any point in time. I think it's just, here's a feature, iframes, makes sense. Then let's also have a feature of being able to control the visual layout and transparency of all the elements in the page. That also makes sense. Combination doesn't work out so well. Question? I'm sorry? Well, you can certainly make transparent images, but they don't have any buttons that are interesting to click on. Uh, yeah. All right, so let me talk maybe in the remaining five or more seven minutes about another important class of security problems in web applications, which is uh, cross-site scripting. So cross-site scripting typically abbreviated XSS. Uh, this is like the buffer overflow of the web. It's like the persistent attack that we know how to fix, but that's just really hard to avoid, very much like buffer overflows. We kind of know how to fix them, but that's just hard to eliminate them 100% from applications. So here's the setup for cross-site scripting. The problem is that you might have um, a victim browser here that uh, is visiting a site like Facebook, let's say. So here we have facebook.com. And Facebook allows you to post comments. So here we'll have a more complicated setup. We'll have both the browser and now we'll have an attacker also talking to Facebook.com. So here's our attacker. They don't even need to use a real browser. They can just send HTTP requests however they like. But the request they're gonna to try to send to Facebook is they're gonna post a comment and, or you know, a page or whatever, something on Facebook that will have some Attacker chosen text, like hello, and then a script tag. And, you know, I don't know, some code chosen by the adversary. And here is a potential mistake that Facebook could make in their web application code. If they take this piece of data that the attacker sent as their comment and literally store that and send that on to another user when they ask for comments on a page, then this script tag is gonna be sent to the victim browser. 
So suppose that our victim comes along and looks at the comments on a particular Facebook page, then the Facebook server is going to send out, oh, here are the comments. The, one of the comments is indeed this message, hello, and a script tag. So why is this going to be a problem? Well, because now on the victim's browser, the victim is running in the facebook.com origin with access to the users, to the victim's Facebook cookie. But now it's going to run this code from the adversary inside of that origin, as if the code came from Facebook. And this code is going to have access to, well, everything related to this origin in the victim's page. It might have access to, in particular, the facebook.com cookie. So the adversary in this code can take the facebook.com cookie and somehow launder it out of the victim's browser and send it to the attacker. Does this make sense as, a, as an attack or as something that can go wrong? Questions about this? So how do we prevent something like this? Yeah. So, okay, so you're proposing using a binary format for the web page itself? Ah, okay, so, okay, so this is like an answer to like, okay, how could we prevent this if the world was different? Okay, fair enough, yeah, yeah, so, so okay, so one way is like we could not, we could like not have script tags and like have separate code for WASM on the side and then HTML, that's data, and separate code. I agree, that would be a wonderful design and would have, wouldn't it be great if, like, in 95, uh, they, they realized this? But, okay, so, so like, some of this web, sec web security discussion is kind of depressing. It's like, well, you know, we're stuck with what we got. What do we do now? So, I guess, yeah, what, what do we do now about these cross-site scripting bugs? <laughs> yeah? Okay, so one answer is there's this feature called content security policy. So what content security policy lets some origin say is basically specify some restrictions on how, uh, what features that web page can use. So for example, facebook.com might be able to set a content security policy for its pages that uh, prohibits, for example, uh, inline scripts. So it might say no inline scripts. That's one of the flags you can set in uh, the content security policy. So if facebook.com says no inline scripts, then that is not a legit thing to say. That's not a thing you're allowed to do. But an adversary might instead do something like, you know, script source from some URL, a.com. That's not in line. So now you have to probably set more content security policies. Uh, in particular, you might actually say, you know, scripts are allowed only from maybe facebook.com so maybe if that's your, or that's another flag you can set in your content security policy is restrict where your scripts can come from. So this would not be allowed. Um, but here's another sort of subtle thing. Facebook probably allows you to upload photos to facebook.com. And you can upload some piece of JavaScript code as your photo. It's a malformed JPEG file, but it's a piece of JavaScript code that's going to be hosted on facebook.com now as your picture. So now you might try to do something like, as an adversary, script source equals, you know, facebook.com slash photo slash whatever, you know, photo the adversary uploaded that happens to be a malformed photo but perfectly good JavaScript. So now probably this is not a good plan for the content security policy. Maybe you should, like, have a separate domain name for hosting your scripts. Uh, so maybe this is, like, you know, fbjs.com or something like this. So actually you shouldn't allow scripts to come from an origin where you're hosting user uploaded photos or other content. You should really isolate stuff to a separate origin there. Uh, yeah. Ah, uh, buffer flow bugs, man. Yeah, everywhere. Yeah, but like, not for this lecture. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah, okay, yeah, yeah, sorry, yeah, yeah. Okay, so you're absolutely right that, like, one answer is content security policy. Another plan is actually sanitize this data, right? So it might be that, uh, what, well, one interpretation of what went wrong is that Facebook.com's server should have removed all the script tags from the comment. Why are you putting script tags in comments? So maybe 
one plan is just remove all the tags. It's like you're not allowed to use the less than sign in your comment. Or if you do, maybe you like, you know, um, you know, change the tags into entities. What I mean is that, uh, you know, if you have something like, you know, foo, that should be like ampersand less than, foo, ampersand greater than. So it's like the text amper less than foo greater than, not the tag. So you can certainly have your web server change that. Or maybe you should like prohibit all tags or maybe remove certain problematic tags, etc. So this is sort of the second plan of having the server sanitize data is much more common in some way, or it's sort of the main defense in addition to the content security policy. It's hard to get the content security policy to be exactly what you want uh, because of all kinds of funny things. It's like content security policy is like the baggy bounce checking of cross-site scripting. It like really helps you uh, make the attacks more difficult or maybe impossible to pull off sometimes, but really sort of the right answer in some sense is the server should be very careful in sending out user supplied content because it might cause some victim to misinterpret script tags as the server's own. So indeed, that's sort of the main thing. You guys will look at much more uh, detail on web security in lab four, which we'll post in a week or two or something like that. All right, any last questions about web security? All right, so this is about web security. We'll have a recitation in lecture here on Thursday where we'll do a much more hands-on thing walking through much more concrete examples of what goes wrong in web security. And then we'll start talking about the network uh, the week after that. So see you guys then.